Hi, myself, Dr. S.K. Bhushya. This is a video lecture in physics for class 12 students. The topic is electrostatics. Lesson 6 of chapter 1, Electric Flux and Gauss's Law. This is a photograph of Carl Frederick Gauss. In this lesson, we'll discuss electric fields of continuous charge distributions, electric flux, and finally, Gauss's law. So let's begin. Continuous charge distributions. We have learned that Coulomb's law gives the electric field of a point charge. We have also learned that the principle of superposition in combination with Coulomb's law gives the electric fields of multiple point charges. But very often, charges are distributed over some regions. For example, along a line or over a surface, or throughout a volume. However, it is not a big problem to generalize the principle of superposition to a continuous distribution. To do that, we begin by defining charge per unit length of a line lambda charge per unit area of a surface, sigma, and finally, charge per unit volume of a body, rho. We divide the continuous distribution into infinitesimal parts and regard every part as a point charge. The point charge is thus replaced with dq equal to lambda dl for line charge. equal to sigma dA for surface stars, and equal to rho dTa for volume charges, respectively. Next, we apply Coulomb's law to obtain the electric field set up by dQ at an arbitrary point P and then integrate over the entire distribution. For example, the electric field of a line charge is E equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught integration over the line R cap by R square into lambda dl. Here the electric field E is in vector notation. Similarly, electric field of a surface charge is E equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught integration over the surface R cap by R square into sigma dA. And finally, the field of a volume charge is E equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught integration over the volume R cap by R square into rho data. Regarding the asterisks, the summation employed for discrete charges has to be replaced with integration for continuous distributions. This is, however, easier said than done. These vector integrations are difficult to evaluate, and in particular, if the lines, the surfaces, or the volumes are not regular in shape. For example, not a straight line, not a plane square surface, or not a cylinder, etc., then the integrations are not doable and analytical. Thus, Coulomb's law is a restricted means to obtain the electric fields of continuous charge distributions. Most of the electrostatics is a study of various tools and tricks to obtain the electric fields of different types of such distributions. Gauss's law is one of such tools and it is in our next agenda. But before that, we require the definition of electric flux. Electric flux through a surface is defined as phi E equal to integration over the surface E dot dA. Here E as well as 
DA are vectors. DA is an element of the surface wherein the electric field is E. The integration is over the entire surface. If the electric field is uniform and the surface is a plane one, then the electric flux is equal to E A cos theta equal to dot product of the factors E and A. Here, A is the area of the surface and theta is the angle between the electric field and the outward normal to the surface. If, on the other hand, the surface is normal to the electric field, then flux to the surface is E A cos zero equal to E A. In this equation, E and A are appearing in their magnitudes only. Qualitatively, electric flux through a surface is proportional to the number of electric field lines passing through the surface. The dictionary meaning of flux, which is a noun, is the action or process of flowing or flowing out. Then why do we call phi E equal to integration E of dA as the electric flux, although an electric field in itself cannot flow? We can see that flux of water across a surface is given by integration V dot dA, where V is the velocity vector of the flowing water and dA is an element of a hypothetical surface in water. Perhaps the similarity with the quantitative expression for flux of water, or for that matter of any other fluid, is the rationale behind the naming of phi E equal to integration E dot dA as electric flux. Gauss's law. The statement, the net electric flux across a closed hypothetical surface is one by epsilon naught times the total electric charge enclosed by the surface. Quantitatively, flux through a closed surface is equal to Q subscript ENC divided by epsilon naught. Here E is the electric field dA is an element of a closed surface. Q subscript ENC is a total charge enclosed by the surface. ENC stands for the word enclosed. Epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space. And the integration here is over the entire closed surface. The integration symbol with a circle in the middle and the word surface as a subscript means integration over a closed surface. For simplicity, let us illustrate Gauss's law in respect of a hypothetical closed spherical surface. Let Q be a point charge located at the center of a spherical surface of radius R. Let dA be an area element of the spherical surface. The electric field in the element of the surface is given by Coulomb's law as E in vector notation equal to one by four pi epsilon naught Q by R square into R cap. This is equation one. Here R cap is radial from the location of the point charge. The electric flux through the area element dA of the surface is therefore E dot dA equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught Q by R square multiplied by dA and multiplied by R cap dot N cap, where N cap defines the direction of the area element and as shown in the figure is radially outward. Regarding the asterisk, as dA is small, the field may be assumed to be constant over the area element. Continuing from the previous slide, R cap dot N cap is equal to 1. So the flux through the area element of the spherical surface simplifies as E dot dA equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught Q by R square into dA. Therefore, the flux through the whole of the closed spherical surface is
q by epsilon naught. This we get after a few simple steps. Q by epsilon naught means charge enclosed by the closed surface divided by epsilon naught. This is as per Gauss's law. Now, electric field due to an infinitely long, straight, uniformly charged wire. The electric field of an infinitely long, straight, uniformly charged wire has cylindrical symmetry. That is, the field has the same magnitude at every point of a coaxial cylindrical surface around the wire and is radial in direction. Outward for positive charges and inward for negative charges. Let us consider a positively charged wire. The wire has a uniform linear charge density, lambda, say. Let us draw a Gaussian cylinder of length L and radius R coaxial with the wire. As already stated, the electric field is radially outward. Regarding the asterisks, closed surfaces drawn for solving Gauss's law problems are referred to as Gaussian surfaces. Electric flux through this surface is Q subscript ENC divided by epsilon naught equal to lambda L by epsilon naught. We may express phi E, the electric flux, as sum of fluxes through the calf surface of the cylinder and through its two plane leads as given by equation two. As seen from the figure, E and DA are parallel in the calf surface while they are mutually perpendicular in the plane leads. Therefore, the flux through the calf surface is equal to E multiplied by twice pi R into L. Twice pi R into L is in fact the area of the calf part of the cylinder. And the flux to the plane leads is, we can see it is equal to zero. Therefore, flux to the Gaussian cylinder is E into twice pi R into L. We call it equation five. Now, equating equations one and five, we have lambda L divided by epsilon naught equal to E into twice pi R into L. Therefore, electric field E is equal to one by two pi epsilon naught multiplied by lambda by R. We call it equation six. Inserting the direction, electric field E in vector form is equal to one by two pi epsilon naught multiplied by lambda by r, multiplied by r cap, where r cap is a unit vector pointing radially outward. Electric field due to a uniformly charged infinite plane seat. The electric field of an uniformly charged plane seat has planar symmetry. That is, the field has the same magnitude at all equidistant points from the seat on both sides and is normal to the set. Pointing outward for a positive set and pointing inward for a negative set. We will, however, consider a positive set. Let the uniform surface density of charge of the set be sigma. We draw a Gaussian pillbox extending equal distances on both sides of the seat. <clears throat> Electric flux through the pillbox is Q subscript ENC divided by epsilon naught is equal to sigma A divided by epsilon naught. Here, A is the area of each lead of the pillbox. 
we may express electric flux phi e as the sum of fluxes through the leads of the pillbox and through its sides as in the equation 2. As seen from the figure, electric field E and the area element DA are parallel for the leads while they are mutually perpendicular in the sides. Therefore, the flux through the leads is E into twice A. <clears throat> it is twice A because there are two leads of the pillbox. And the flux through the sides is zero. Therefore, the flux through the Gaussian pillbox is flux equal to E into twice A. Now, equating equations one and five, we get sigma A divided by epsilon naught equal to E into twice A. Or electric field E equal to sigma by two epsilon naught. Inserting the direction, electric field in vector notation is equal to sigma by two epsilon naught into n cap, where n cap is a unit vector pointing away from the seat on either side. Remarks on Gauss's law. Gauss's law is always true, but useful as a tool for obtaining the electric field of a continuous such distribution only if the distribution possesses any one of the following three symmetries. Spherical symmetry, cylindrical symmetry, and planar symmetry. The next essential step is to consider an appropriate Gaussian surface to exploit the symmetry. If the above two conditions are met, Gauss's law evaluates electric fields effortlessly. Sort questions with answers. Question number one. What is the nature of the electric field inside a charged conductor? Let us consider an arbitrary interior point P in a charged conductor. We draw a Gaussian surface through the point and make sure that it lies wholly inside the conductor. Gauss's law gives the electric flux through the closed surface as phi E equal to Q subscript ENC divided by epsilon naught. Since charges do not reside inside a conductor, we have Q subscript ENC equal to zero. So, the flux is equal to zero. This means that the electric field E is equal to zero as other quantities in the integrand cannot be zero. As the location of the point was arbitrary, the field is zero everywhere inside the charge conductor. Question number two, find the electric field due to a charged infinite plane metal sheet. The case of a charged infinite plane metal sheet, that is a conducting sheet, is different from a uniformly charged infinite plane sheet. In a metal sheet, charges reside only on the surface. And of course, the surface charge density is uniform here also, naturally. In order to incorporate this difference, one of the leads of the Gaussian pillbox is deliberately terminated inside the seat. Now, the electric flux through the pillbox is Q subscript TNC divided by epsilon naught is equal to sigma A by epsilon naught. We call it equation one. As before, we express the flux phi E as the sum of fluxes through the leads of the pillbox and through its sides, as in equation two. 
but this time the flux to the leads is E multiplied by E as shown in equation 3. The electric field is zero inside, so the interior lead does not contribute. And the flux to the sides is as before, is equal to zero. Therefore, flux to the entire Gaussian peel box is E multiplied by A. Now equating equations one and five, sigma A by epsilon naught is equal to E multiplied by A. Simplifying, we get the electric field as sigma by epsilon naught. Inserting the direction, electric field in vector notation is equal to sigma by epsilon naught multiplied by n cap, where n cap is a unit vector pointing away from the set. Question number three, a point charge Q is situated at the center of a cube. Find the electric flux through any one phase of the cube. The total electric flux through the six phases of the cube is given by Gauss's law as Q subscript TNC divided by epsilon not equal to Q by epsilon not. As all the six phases of the cube are symmetrically situated with respect to the pointures, so the electric flux through any one phase of the cube is Q by six epsilon naught. Question number four, find the electric field outside a uniformly charged sphere of radius capital R. The electric field outside a uniformly charged sphere has a spherical symmetry. That is the field has the same magnitude at every point of a concentric spherical surface around the sphere and is radial in direction. Outward for positive charges and inward for negative charges. Let us consider a positively charged sphere with charge capital Q. Let us draw a Gaussian spherical surface of radius smaller concentric with the sphere. As already stated, the electric field is radially outward for a positively charged sphere. The electric flux through this surface is Q subscript TNC divided by epsilon naught is equal to Q by epsilon naught. We call it equation one. Clearly, E and DA are parallel. Therefore, electric flux is finally obtained as E multiplied by four by R square. We call it equation two. Now equating equations one and two, electric flux equal to Q by epsilon naught equal to E multiplied by four by R square. Simplifying, the electric field E is equal to one by four by epsilon naught Q by R square. Inserting the direction, electric field in vector notation is equal to one by four pi epsilon naught Q by R square multiplied by R cap, where R cap is a unit vector pointing radially outward. Corollary questions. Number one, what is the electric field at a point on the surface of a uniformly charged sphere? Allow the Gaussian spherical surface to collapse and ultimately coincide with the surface of the charged sphere. Redo the calculation, the final result would be obtained as electric field E equal to 1 by 4 by epsilon naught Q by capital R square into R cap. Number two, what will be the electric field for a charged conducting sphere or a charged conducting spherical cell? The charges will be spontaneously distributed over the surface of the conducting sphere or the conducting shell with a uniform charge phase charge density. So their fields too possess 
spherical symmetry and also R radial. So following the procedure of the previous problem, we'll get for outside electric field E equal to one by four by epsilon naught Q by small r square into r cap. And on the surface, electric field equal to one by four by epsilon naught Q by capital R square into r cap. Number three, what is the electric field at an interior point of a uniformly charged sphere? This problem is left for you to solve, but I'll give you two hints. Start with a uniform volume charge density, rho. Exploit the fact that charges residing outside the internal point do not contribute to the field. What will be your answer if the charged sphere is made of copper? Remark. Read your paragraph carefully. You may use the information given here for the solution of different types of problems in electrostatics. With this, we have come to the end of lesson six. We'll discuss electric dipoles in the next lesson. Till then, goodbye and thank you.